So what I want to do is just take you through uh, the, uh, some of the aspects which I think are relevant to from a consultancy perspective. And every story has a villain and every story has a superhero. And sadly, the villain in the uh, Salesforce story is often you. Um, uh, we have lots of uh, org confessions where, oh, the consultants did this to us, they left us with no documentation, they didn't really understand the requirements, they delivered late, and, and I get that, but the problem is it's not your fault. Often we have no visibility of what the client's org looks like, and they claim they've never made any changes, and you walk in and discover that uh, there's a bunch of managed packages, they've customised the hell out of it, and you've got to unpick that before you can even get going. I think the second challenge is one that Salesforce has, all, uh, which sets up for you, which is the account exec just wants to get the deal done. Uh, they say oh, it was quick and simple to implement. It should only take three or four days. And you know when you will talk to the client, it's going to take 30 days, if not more. So you're always fighting against the, uh, the expectations set by Salesforce. And uh, again, in the last 20 years, the implementations for Salesforce have gone from five objects and really simple all the way through to now massively complex, highly strategic implementations. And I wrote an article uh, just recently, and I'll, I'll, I'll send a link at, at the end, um, which is about the center of excellence. And it talks about the growth of Salesforce and the growth of the maturity of the application and therefore the complication of those implementations. And then the last thing is, the clients really have their have no apps or tools to support the implementation lifecycle. Uh, Salesforce says everything you need is in the box, which is not quite true. So the default is, oh, well, let's just use free stuff. <clears throat> and I was talking to a customer the other day, and they said, oh, we're tiny. We've only got 30 users. They're still spending 40 to $50,000 a year on Salesforce, plus all the cost of the team supporting it. And to be able to do that with no tools, Excel spreadsheets, we go to the top end when we're dealing with customers and they've, they're spending 10 million, 2 million, 30 million on Salesforce and they're still trying to manage it with Excel spreadsheets and making stuff up. So that's really the hole that we're trying to fill in terms of, of elements. So we want to make you the superhero, not the villain. So if I think about your world, You've got clients asking you to do things like, can you accelerate our implementation? Can you give us a better return on investment from Salesforce? Uh, can you help us reduce our tech debt? Can you document our org? Can you build some apps? Can you build this app, but at the same time, can you increase adoption? And that's where you as a consultancy are trying to win work at the same time as managing the client's expectation about how long this will take to do it properly to make sure that genuinely the apps that you build, the projects that you deliver are gonna make a difference to the business, not just, oh, I built an app and we can run away. So if I think about the first phase of when you go into a client, you have to go and discover their org. You have to work out what, you, what they've got in there. And that may be part of winning work. Uh, we're working with some of the big SIs who will do org discovery, and that actually is opening up the client. So that's free work they're doing to help the, cu the customer understand exactly what challenges they've got. And that uncovers a whole series of opportunities. So this org discovery is, is the tricky bit. It's really scary. You've no idea what they've built. They have no idea what they've built. And unless you understand what's in the org, I think it makes it very difficult to give a fair uh, and, and accurate assessment of the amount of work that it takes. So to support you, we've built um, the, what we call the org discovery process. And any one of you can access it, download it, look at it. It's inside elements. You can see that it's boxes. And then you can see the paper clips have got uh, our links to supporting documentation. And here's a quote from one of the bigger SIs. We allocated two weeks for the team for a 20 year old org. We were done in less than a week. I look like a superhero. And they've been blown away by how much insight they got into the org uh, in, an, in literally the first day. And they went through this org, said this, uh, this org discovery process step by step. And again, not every uh, thing in the step in these uh, the discovery process is elements. It's yeah, use org optimizer, use our free org maturity um, assessment, 
So it's not just saying, oh, you have to use elements. There are parts of it are elements, parts of it are other tools out there. Parts of it is how do I ask the questions of, uh, of, my, of the customer? So the first step we think is an org assessment. We created an org assessment tool, 70 questions, takes about 20 minutes to do, and it will give you this spider chart of how, uh, how good are you across five dimensions? Analyze, build, deliver, operate, and governance. The customer is actually quite illuminating taking the customer through those questions. And they're not technical questions. They are about your org implementation maturity. How well do you go around that org implementation lifecycle? So that's the starting point. Like, what are you trying to do with the org? What's your vision? What's the, in terms of governance, what's your um, governance framework look like? How well do you do analyze? How well do you do testing? What's your deployment approach? So these are open questions you simply uh, um, rate the question on a scale of one to uh, zero to ten it takes about 20 minutes uh, it comes back with this spider chart and then you can have a decent discussion with the customer about like why are we so low here oh this is great you're amazing in this area because you've got some really high points so i think it starts to draw the conversation away from can you build me an app and what's your day rate to how can we how can we help you drive a better uh, uh, implementation lifecycle and deliver apps, deliver business change, deliver business benefits more quickly. So part of the analysis is actually using elements. So I'll show you a little bit of how elements can help you on the org discovery. And then we'll think about how after that, we'll think about how you can deliver the around the implementation lifecycle. Background, elements.cloud runs on AWS. It doesn't run on top of Salesforce, but it has a tight integration into Salesforce. So the first thing I want to show you is our org analysis. So what happens here is we've connected elements to a Salesforce org, could be a sandbox, could be production, and we pull all the metadata. So you can see here, this is all the metadata we pulled out of this org. Uh, relatively small, three managed packages, um, 667 Apex classes. What it's giving you here on the right hand side is right, how big it is, but on the left hand side, you can open up any one of these and go, there, there are the Apex classes. So if I click on that, then on the right hand side, I've now it's context sensitive. All right, tell me where, which fields are used in this Apex class. I can even run some dependency analysis. What documentation? So this, this won't be populated, but this is where you can start to add the documentation of what you discover. Uh, you could even use this tab here to start to identify cleanup activities associated with this particular metadata item. Uh, you can link it back to any user stories or requirements. That will be used when you're in the, in the implementation lifecycle. At this phase, you're simply looking at stuff. But the ability to identify, okay, these are things which could be changed as you're going through the discovery or making notes as you're going through the discovery cycle of going, oh, I found this. So this is Apex classes, and I'm not going to go through every single one. Uh, but let's go back to, I mean, dashboards. Here's a dashboard. First question is, which reports is it used in? I could then link, look at that report, open up that report, and start to dig into the report and say which fields are used in. So again, very quick wins, which are, are the key dashboards that your executive team looking at are they being fed by reports and are those four reports being fed by data which is accurate? Uh, let's go into objects because when, when we get to an object, we then start giving you a lot more information. So here's a custom object. We obviously, we do uh, all the standard objects as well, but here's a, here's a custom object. If I click on the object, now it's telling me you know, how many approval processes, how many custom fields, how many process builder workflows. How many records by record type? So I've got 121 records, only one record type, only one record in finance. Um, all these others have no data in them at all. We also assess every single field. So we'll tell you which fields are low. What that means is they have no data. Uh, which ones are high? They're important. They're used in validation rules. They're used in process builder workflows. They have more than a certain level of data, uh, a certain amount of data in them. So, I mean, I'm sure you walk into situations where the customer says, I know I've maxed out my opportunity object. I've got no more fields. What do I do? Well, this will very quickly tell you, well, do you know what? Of those 500 fields, I know 127 have no data in them. 
doesn't mean we can delete them, but certainly they are candidates for deletion. But if I drill down a bit further, I can start to say, okay, well, let's have a look at this particular uh, object. And now I can see the field population. So those of you who use field trip, we do the equivalent of field trip by record type for every object every night. Just gets done. You don't have to go and find an object, go and set it up, go and run the report. And all of this is in the context of every single object. And you're looking at it here, but we can also see it inside setup. So here we go. All those fields that, the, that they absolutely needed, none of them filled out. If we go down a little bit further, let's just go down and look at a field. Let's pick a field. Now you can see the, impact, the field impact here. You can see what state of, in terms of optimization, have we identified it should be cleaned up. Uh, let, now, let, budget's a field I know well. So there's the budget field. Budget field, the description isn't even completed. If I, if I enter a description there, it will update Salesforce with that description. If there is a, if there's some Salesforce help text, we'll see it here. Uh, if I look at, say, we now start looking at the field, I can now see whether it's populated by record type. So this field is populated 100% by uh, when it's a finance record type, 60% when it, there's no record type, and clearly it's not populated at all there. And I've, I've only got 121 records. We will look at up to 50 million records to go and do this analysis for you. I can see this field's high impact. If I roll over, it'll tell me why. And if I want to understand how, I, we, val how we do the assessment, there's a, there's a help article. Or well, you can click on that help article there. If we go down a little bit further, now we'll tell you where it's used. Now, it's used in one formula field. Roll over it, it'll tell me what that is. It's used in four page layouts. Okay, so that one, no idea what that one is. Pete in finance. So maybe there are some page layouts there which we just don't need. It's used in four reports. Again, we can start to look at, roll over those. Used in two validation rules. Roll over, it'll tell me what the validation rules are. And it, we didn't find it in those other, other 11 places. So we look in 15 different metadata types. The one that's missing that some of you may be looking for is record types. Uh, record types are like glitter. Once you've got them, you can't get rid of them, uh, but they're really hard to, to go and do the analysis. We're currently writing the code to find everywhere a record type is referenced. So that's the first level. So that's just where is this field used? But where else, what's the knock-on effect? And we've got this thing called the dependency analysis. So we use our code, the metadata API and the dependency API to build this picture. And this is giving you a multi-level view of if I make a change to this field, what's the knock-on effect? So I can click on, I can see here that it's used in some page layouts and some custom fields. I click on any item, it will tell me more about it. Okay, so this field is called by another field called currency calc. Oh yeah, I can see in the formula, but I can see there's a plus here, which means actually that's called by somewhere else, which is called by somewhere else. Or well, this report, this report's used in those two dashboards. Again, click on them and it will tell me about, more about any item. And you see there are two links. One is it a link back into our tree structure, but if I click on that, it will open up Salesforce setup on that item. So let's just have some fun. That one there, custom, custom field. If I click on that, it will open up that field in setup. So I don't have to go and search my way through um, object, uh, the object uh, search and then try and find the field. And there we go. I'm now on the field called currency calc. But you may notice this right hand panel has popped up. So everything that we know about it coming from elements is now inside setup. There's that dependency view. There's that documentation. There are those user stories. There's some discussion. There is Field access, this field is used in three profiles. It's not used in any permission sets. So everything I've been showing you over here in terms of this right panel for every metadata item, if you click on that little blue icon, it will open it up inside setup. So this is giving you a ton of power to understand what's in the org. 
Uh, we also give you a high level view of the org. So quick summary, what's in it. If you've been running the uh, elements for a while inside an org, it will actually give you some history about what's been changed. Obviously, if you're going into a client new, this won't work, but over the course of the engagement, you can start to see how things have changed. Uh, another quick one, how well are, how well have they done in terms of completing descriptions? So if this is just a description field inside Salesforce. Um, let's go down to some other things. I know how well populated are objects. So this is back to that field trip view, but this is now the overview by object. And again, you can filter by standard objects and custom objects. Uh, that view about how well used are fields. So here we're saying these fields, low impact, which means they're not being used. Um, uh, potentially we could de delete those. Again, I can, these are, this obviously is my demo org, so there's not very much data in there. But again, very useful in starting to understand, okay, where should we focus in the efforts? The customer goes, we've got a real problem around opportunity. Great, well, let's have a look at the opportunity objects and let's see what, how many fields, uh, how many of them are used, uh, how many record types. I won't, I won't dig into all of these, but again, what, what I'm, the point about this is we're giving you some insights into your org. It takes two minutes to connect the org and it takes between about 15 minutes and two hours to synchronize and produce this report. Uh, that massive, massive, massive org, uh, which was 20 years old, uh, took six hours and it was, it was 2000 times bigger in terms of metadata than any other org we've seen. We, we, we analyzed some huge orgs. Uh, just to give you some stats, we've all, to date we've uh, analyzed over a billion metadata items. We do over a million API calls a day now uh, to pull the data and do the, and do the analysis across all of our clients. We've done, we've talked about win work, we've talked about discover org, but let's just focus on how you deliver great work for your customers. And that may well overlap with the discover org piece. It may be uh, completely separate. The discover org was a piece of work you did either for free or paid, but then that opened up a new client opportunity. And then the back end of this is supporting the client because even though uh, maybe the, the project is over, I'm sure they ring up and say, oh, um, I know Stuart built this org for me and we can't remember why this validation rule works like that. Now, no disrespect to Stuart, but uh, I can't even remember what I had for lunch yesterday, let alone how I con configured a validation rule in a client six months ago. So how do you support the client, which potentially creates more, more work to, uh, to go back in and do more work for the customer? So how do you leave the customer in a state where if you go back in, even if it's not you, it was another consultant, they can pick up uh, relatively quickly from where you left off. So we look at implementations around this implementation life cycle. Uh, the whole idea that there's the analyze phase, which is like, tell me what you really want, not what you thought you needed. And there is a difference there. Um, then through the build phase, deliver, and then into operate. And then of course, then operate gives you then more feedback to go back to analyze. Our experience is that this implementation lifecycle, A, not very, very well understood by customers, B, not very mature, and C, there are no tools to support it. So the org maturity, that org assessment, asks questions to help people understand how well they do this lifecycle. So let me just, let's just think about starting with Analyze. You may end up with requirements, which could be a statement of work, could be a set of wish lists, uh, sometimes th those requirements are very high level, which is we need Einstein, or they can be very detailed, which is I need a new pick list. And the job is to start to sift through those and any feedback and start to validate, triage and prioritize those requirements so you can start to deliver meaningful lumps of work. And the best way to start to, to get the customer to understand what are real requirements and what are mythical requirements is to start to document their business processes really quickly some process maps which will then validate the requirements but it will also identify new requirements and the example i always like to give is oh we need some new pick list items well talk me through the process maybe you don't need a pick list item maybe you need a new record type and that record type then requires some new um, dashboards or some new reports or some new uh, list views 
So what a customer goes, I need one of these, often they don't know what they really need. The second thing is you need to do an org impact assessment, which is back to that tree structure I showed you. What are the implications of making these changes? So we can then write really crisp user stories because that's what the technical specification is. Again, uh, some uh, our largest customers understand this stuff. The smaller customers don't understand what a user story is compared with a requirement, compared with just a wish list. So getting them on the right page of saying, here are a list of user stories I want to so that I can, uh, so I, as a, so that I want to, so that I can, that standard user story. And let's add on top of that, a level of risk. We know the I know, technical risk, we know the operational risk, we know the regulatory risk. So then we can understand how much testing we need to do. I wrote a rather emotive art, uh, document article called Develop in Production and everyone threw their hands up and go, you can't, you can't possibly say that. If you understand the risk of a user story, you can then make sure you take either a fast path to getting into production or you need to go through a very rigorous path but unless you understand the risk of the user story, you can't choose that. Everything has to go through the slowest path, the most rigorous testing. And that is wasteful and it also slows getting things getting into production. When we're in the build phase, obviously Salesforce is great at configure code. Uh, it's got some testing tools. There is no way to document the changes you've made. And therefore we're providing the platform to document every change you make. So when you come back around the cycle again, the org impact analysis is not just tell me the things, tell me the implication of making a change, but also you have some context. Here's the documentation. This field may be empty, but it's used in an Oracle integration. Okay, let, let's not delete that. This is used in end of year processing. That's why it's empty at the moment. Don't go and delete it. Uh, Often you can work out how somebody did, did something or even what they did, but the, the really difficult thing is understanding why it was implemented in a certain way. And that's where that documentation piece helps. And you can see there's this central database. The answer is everything goes back into one central source. So therefore we can reuse it in as many places as possible. Uh, we don't do backup. We don't do deploy data loads. There are some great tools out there for doing that. And then into release. So that may be change sets, might be, uh, we've got a tight integration with Capado. So when you're releasing into production, how do we leverage all of this information we've already, already produced? How do we then release, say the process maps as training material? And then we're into operate. Compliance is about, okay, are our end users following our processes because we're highly regulated, but then train and feedback. How do we use any of the content from over here and analyze as training material rather than have to write new training material and then how do we capture feedback from end users so we can go around the cycle again? And the trick here is how do we accelerate this life cycle without breaking the org? Again, as a consultant, you get paid more based on the size of the problems you fix. So if it's send two people because we need some more pick lists, that's a low cost and you're fighting against offshore resources. If it's helped me transform my business and accelerate my implementation life cycle, there are far bigger benefits and therefore that the day rates for that or the, the, the value for that to the customer and therefore what uh, the size of the project and the, it is far, far greater, absolutely. And you need to be moving up market into the consultancy business rather than the, the day rate uh, configure business. So let me show you how some of this works. Uh, let me start with at a requirement level. So inside elements, here is a list of requirements. You can import them from an Excel spreadsheet. You can type them in, uh, but here is a list of requirements um, and any one of these requirements, if I click on that, again, you, you'll see a familiar sort of story. What external docu additional documentation is there? Um, are there links to user stories? You can even have a discussion here, but these requirements then have a status. So there is a workflow we've built where um, there are certain statuses that, that a requirement goes through. You can configure those on a client by client basis, on a space by space basis. So you can say, okay, this is the life cycle. So we can start to track them rather than making it just, okay, here's an Excel spreadsheet or here's a statement of work. There's a way of formally managing this. And again, you can share those, share this with other people. You can have discussions about, uh, about a particular requirement. 
uh, and you can at mention people. So you're starting to engage the customers in, okay, what are the requirements? And then how do we phase them by release? Which release is this one scheduled for? So this is user requirements. Um, a user requirement could be linked to a set of user stories. So there's a user story. I want, as a dot, 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 I want to dot, 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 so that I can. Phase, what phase is this? This is, this is in the de in design phase. Uh, it's high risk, technical risk, it's medium operational risk, it's a medium regulatory risk, it's medium complexity, this many story points. Therefore, the risk of this, this story is high. And here is a link to JIRA. If the customer is using JIRA, we have a tight integration, so we sync with JIRA. So the user story from us or JIRA user stories uh, stay in sync. And with this user story, so which metadata items is this use, user story going to touch? So these are the user stories back in that tree. So now we are pulling all that information about that user story because we know everything about the metadata inside the org. Do you need to add some documentation? Okay, here's some links to an initial scope. Here's some links to the processes where it's used. And I'll, I'll have a look at, we'll go to the process diagram in a moment. And again, having discussions. So we've got requirements and user stories. And I said that the process map is the way to start to validate those requirements and, and identify the user stories. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with our process mapping tool. Um, it's high, if you're not, a couple of things about why it's different from a more traditional diagramming tool like Visio, Lucidchart, Google Slides. Number one, uh, it's version controlled. So this is currently version three and I can go back and see the history. Second thing, it's hierarchical. Any one of these diagrams can drill down to the next level of detail. So we're not building a diagram, we're building a process map, which is a hierarchy of diagrams. Why is that important? It means you can, you can create, make the diagram smaller because you have fewer boxes on a screen. I can understand this. I haven't got 150 boxes. If I want to know how we scope a project, let's click on there and roll down to the next level of detail. And then the third thing is we can link to attachments. And if I go down, let's click on that. I'll go down to the next level of detail. There we go. I'm now a level down. And you can see there are some paper clips here that are attached. And that, that essentially is training material. How This is the standard operating procedure link. These are some notes on how we, in this case, it's a project procedure. Um, here's a link to the different metadata items inside Salesforce, which are used to deliver that particular step. And again, I could drill down on any one of these. Let's just go into edit mode. Again, you should be able to use this in live workshops. So I'm in the draft version. I could just, I know, double click, double click. Line uh, between there and there, double click to change the text. That box, right mouse click, add some documentation, add a note. Oh, I could add a requirement. So is it a new requirement or is it an existing one? That's an existing one. Let's say it's called, I know, stakeholders. Okay, so it's now filtered to stakeholders. Yeah, it's those two requirements I want to attach. So I click on that and I now see, look, I've linked two requirements to this process step. What's really cool though, is if I, do, if I just look at the highest level, I'm not, I, haven't, I haven't clicked on any box and I look at the requirements, as I roll over a requirement, it lights up which of the boxes, which process steps are, are touched. If I have user stories, this user story is touching those two processes. So suddenly I can start to see, okay, what are the implications of touching any one of these user stories, which processes are touched? Or if I go from the other end and I click on a box, these are the user stories that are, in, are being making changes to this particular process step. So I've looked at it from two ends. This user story is touching this, this part of the business, but also I can see that this part called budget project is being, is being having a series of changes made to it. One's being considered, one's in design, one's being implemented. So I've got three phases of change hitting this particular area of the business. So what you're seeing now is the power of aggregating requirements, user stories, metadata items and now processes. Uh, 
these things are super easy to create. Uh, we've got some of our systems integrators who are building industry prints. They're an expert in a particular area. They're pre-building some of these process diagrams so they can walk into the client and go, the reason we're an expert in our oil and gas field services because look, we've already built the process diagrams out. Uh, anyone who knows how a process works can probably build a decent looking industry print in two or three days. We, we uh, took the work.com app when work.com launched and on the day it launched, we installed work.com and then mapped out the work.com processes. Two of us took a day to do it just to prove it could be done really quickly and blows people away by the level of content. But there's one other thing. When you win that new piece of work with a customer, or even if you're in, this, in the sales cycle, you create a workspace, you take a copy of that pro process map across, and now you can start using that in the discovery phase, in the, even in the pursuit, in, in the winning work phase, use that as the basis of, this is the work we're gonna do for you, and you could use this to start to scope the work. So some really powerful things you can do Again, no, no cost to the customer because it's, you're using your license. Um, and again, back to differentiating what you're doing, be able to win more work. The other thing you can do, of course, is you can build data models. I mean, it's just a different type, it's different, different. But again, you could link a, one of these items. Uh, this happens to be the project system object. I'm linking that back to the project system object back in our tree structure and you may say in that why are you building this because we've got schema builder yeah schema builder is great if you want to have an overall view of it, absolutely everything's been implemented but sometimes you just want you just want to look at we're building a new object but what are the relationships where is this at so if i click on the line and i look at line form i can now go for curly lines rather than oh. straight line. there we go and then oh. i've got the different uh end line ends Oh, you want dotted lines. You know, I have dotted lines, or I want dashed lines, okay? <laughs> the other thing though is, okay, we can start to, same thing, because it's a process diagram. It's just a diagram. Don't think of a, it's a diagram. Now I can link, if I'm linking requirements, to, I can link requirements or user stories to the particular objects, and I can start to see how this object is being changed over time, or this, this particular uh, change report, uh, this particular user story is gonna touch Wow, it's touching four objects. That's actually relatively high impact. We need to be quite careful about what we're doing here. So if I go to the opportunity objects and go, well, what else is, okay, so it's only got one user story, but we've got two requirements against it. So again, seeing the power of this aggregation. Okay, so there's some new, okay, so from between version three and now, I can see there's this new, there's some new boxes that have been put on there. And we're taking a snapshot every time you open and uh, there's this snapshot. Every time you open and close elements, we're taking a screenshot. So it'll take a while to load all the images, but it will, it takes a screenshot of what the diagram looked like. And you can, you can open a full change log. So absolutely when the customer goes, no, I'm sure we talked about it. Well, you signed it off. <laughs> we said, okay, going through the versioning is really straightforward, right? Make ready for release, hit version, Make ready for release. Which version are we targeting? So you create new. We could create a new version. Is it this or this and all its lower levels? Because you can manage hierarchies of diagrams. Feedback signed off by customer X. Enter the password. Done. And now we've got the new version. And, and easy, really simple to do. When we were building out that work.com uh, process maps for the work.com accelerator, we although we did it in a day. Because there were two of us working on it, I think we got through 19 releases. So we could track the changes as we were going through. And one, one change might be, I'm just gonna change the theme. I'm just gonna stick a different theme on this. I'm gonna stick a client theme and we're gonna apply this to, I'll just do this diagram. It's simply gonna go and change what the boxes and lines look like because we've got a, a certain color scheme for the customer. I can see that the budget Project, this step called budget project touches the budget object and it also touches the field benefits case. So you, so you can link, I wouldn't link everything, but I'd link the critical things. If there's a record type that's, that's really important, if there's a dashboard, absolutely you can link any one of these. So if I look at it from the other end, 
Let me go back into our tree structure. Uh, it doesn't matter, this one here. There we go. And that was the field called budget. The power of that is if I'm now looking, so this is the documentation tab. This is like documentation as in notes, photographs. But down here, if I roll over, it's saying this field is used in that step and it's used in that step. So suddenly this field is being used in two completely different processes. So you think you're changing this for the customer and you go, actually, you've now screwed the, um, the implementation team because the, the implementation team also use projects as well as the sales team, we didn't realize. So this idea of connecting the critical objects, fields, record types to the processes gives you a level of visibility you wouldn't normally have. Uh, how, where does, what's this look like inside Salesforce? Two places, well, three actually, but I'll show you two. Uh, one is seeing it inside setup. So every metadata item has this right panel. So everything you saw inside elements gets injected into a right panel inside setup whether it's an Apex class, a page layout, a field, whatever, you have access to like, how we clean it up, where it's used, documentation, uh, user stories. So we're pushing this into a right panel and setup, also in JIRA. Um, so that's the first place. So that's from a development perspective, an implementation perspective. If I go into, here's an object, this is the same object, but I'm now looking at it from a, an end user's perspective. Obviously, it looks like a CVS receipt, as most page layouts seem to. But you can see that there's the help icon inside Salesforce, but some of them have gone purple. And I can make any documentation associated with that field or the object pop up as help. So there is some notes about how you went to budgets. And I can even rate the help. I could, there's the scope project process diagram, which we've all been looking at. You can see it's already been changed. Uh, I can zoom in and out. All those attachments, not the development attachments, but the training attachments are all here. So an end user can go, how do I do stuff? Okay. Um, the other interesting thing is people can leave feedback. So if I start leaving feedback here, this feedback is associated with this field, which will then appear in our feedback list, which we can then use to drive the cycle of user stories. So all the feedback from process diagrams and metadata items all arrive in the same place as requirements to. So you can start to complete, uh, go around that cycle. Uh, you, can, you can attach it at field, at object level. Uh, the other thing is with our Chrome extension, do you want any process diagram, you just go, how do I, how do I raise a case? So there's a lit, you can even make all the processes visible you don't have to be in Salesforce. I could be in Gmail. I could be in a Workday. All those process diagrams are now visible. And I can click on that. It will open up the process diagram. You get the point. And, and it doesn't have to just be Salesforce. It could be anything. So it takes two minutes to connect an org, about two hours to analyze it. Uh, there is a proof of concept page where anybody can get going. What are the implications? I think the implications is this can make you a superhero. It will give you the level of insights that other uh, consultancies don't get. Yeah, we've got more and more consultancies starting to use elements, but it's by no means every single consultancy. So there's some first mover advantage here. A couple of the big GSIs are starting to use it, um, but there is an opportunity here to differentiate yourself by saying, we've got some tools here, which will number one, enable us to accelerate our old discovery. And number two, we can, we can build an implementation lifecycle for you, which you can continue to run, which will mean you get a better return on investment from your Salesforce org. So we're giving you the, or providing you with the tools because they have to pay for them, but they're providing them with the tools, which mean that they can run their Salesforce org better. So pricing, the, the consultant's license is 500 bucks per year per consultant. That means that you can do everything I've just shown you for every single client. And all of that analysis is available to the client for 90 days. So at the end of 90 days, they need to decide what to do. So at the end of the 90 days, they can either go, that's been fantastic, but we don't want to do anything with elements. And you can simply export it to Excel, um, take, the, take the process diagrams, give them to them, and 
or they could say that's fantastic we love the idea of this and we've got a pricing model that says it's five percent of their salesforce spend so whatever they spend on salesforce five percent gives them unlimited licenses for elements all that end user help as many business analysts uh, or admins using all the developer tools so at the end of the project three things can happen they either say i don't this is not for me. It's been a great tool throughout the project. Can you just turn it into PDFs and give it to us? I know that's pointless, but that's what customers want. The second option is the customer says, this is great. Uh, we'd like to buy the licenses. We'd like to keep you involved or we don't want you involved. So at that point, the space can, can, that you created can then be given to them. They run it, they buy licenses. They can choose to invite you into that space or not. Third option, I'm not sure this is relevant to you, but we've got some uh, SIs who are now running a managed service. So they say, don't worry about that. We'll continue to use our license. We'll pay $1,000 a year to, for your connection stuff. And we'll look after all the org implementation and all the documentation for you. And therefore, you run that as a managed service for your customers. So we've tried to keep this really simple, but we've built this with consultants in mind. But again, our job is not to get between you and the client. Our job is to stand behind you and make you look like a superhero. So in terms of supporting you in org discovery, supporting you actually through implementation, uh, implementation projects.